the mountain that I need to climb? Is there a valley you want to make mine? Is there a river I need to cross through? Whatever it takes, I'm willing to face to be close to you. Dear Lord, I believe with all of my heart that the old rugged cross gave me a new start. But somehow I've lost the touch of your hand and I'm willing to do and to go through anything you command. Is there a mountain that I need to climb? Is there a valley you want to make mine? Is there a river I need to cross through? Whatever it takes, I'm willing to face to be close to you. If it takes a mountain, if it takes a hill, remove anything that stands in the way, whatever the price to have you in my life, dear Lord, I pray, is there a mountain that I need to climb, is there a valley to make mine Is there a river I need to cross through Whatever it takes I'm willing to face to be close to you Whatever it takes I'm willing to face to be close to you Well, greetings to our viewers from around the world. Hope you had a great week. Today we will continue the series on Exodus. I am going through the book of Exodus in detail because there are many similarities between the journey of the children of Israel and our journey in life. Like the Israelites were freed from Egypt, a type of sin, and Pharaoh, a symbol of Satan, we were freed from sin by the mighty sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Pharaoh and his armies were destroyed in the Red Sea. Satan and his demons will be destroyed when Jesus Christ returns. And how do we know this? If you go to Mark chapter 1 verses 21 to 26, you will get a little bit of insight into this demonic world, demonic world or the spiritual world that we don't know very much about. Mark chapter 1 verses 21 to 26 from the Message Bible. As, as a matter of fact, I'm using the Message Bible throughout. Then they entered Capernaum. When the Sabbath arrived, Jesus lost no time in getting to the meeting place. He spent the day there teaching. They were surprised at his teachings, so forthright, so confident, not quibbling and quoting like the religious scholars. Suddenly, while still in the meeting place, he was interrupted by a man who was deeply disturbed and yelling out, What business do you have here with us, Jesus, Nazarene? I know what you are up to. You are the Holy One of God and you come to destroy us. Jesus shut him up. Quiet, get out of him. The afflicting spirit threw the man into spasms, protesting loudly, and got out. With the first coming of Jesus Christ on this earth, Satan realized that his days were numbered. So, like Pharaoh, he pulled out all stops, 
to thwart God's plan. He did not succeed and he will not succeed. At the second coming of Jesus, he will be destroyed. The journey of the Israelites in the wilderness was similar to our journey in this world. With its ups and downs and responses, both positive and negative, the presence of God, yet our mistress in him, and the joys of deliverance, but also the bitterness at the inconveniences caused to us. So we go through the same cycle as the nation of Israel went through. And so we should look at what they went through, compare it to what we do in our lives. And in doing so, we will know what to do to avoid the mistakes that the children of Israel made. One of the greatest challenges that we will face in life is to keep bitterness at bay. A lot of things in life have a potential to make us bitter. Family problems, marriage stresses, rejection, past abuses, loneliness, misunderstanding, conflicts, church problems, and the list goes on and on. All of these, if not dealt with, have the potential to make us bitter. Everything we think about will then be processed through this filter of pain and it will affect our thinking, our emotions, our relationship with others and our relationship with God. When that happens, we will lose our effectiveness at accomplishing anything for God in our lives. We need to learn to forgive. Unwillingness to forgive makes us vindictive, vengeful, angry, hateful and bitter. We cease to count our blessings, only our curses. In Exodus chapter 15 verses 1 to 20, we see the Israelites happy and jubilant at the deliverance they had just received at the hands of God. They were so joyful at having been miraculously redeemed from bondage and delivered from the enemy forever that they were full of praise, thanksgiving and songs expressing their jubilation and thanking God. Like us, the children of Israel also experience bitterness. When we come to church, the first thing we do is to praise God in song. Singing songs of praise and thanksgiving uh, brings our mind in tune with God. God loves a cheerful person. He requires that we do everything in life cheerfully. We are also told to give to God cheerfully whether it is of our finances, our time, efforts, or anything in life. When we live in the presence of God Almighty, everything we do becomes worship to God. After the jubilation and joy at being delivered from the Red Sea and the clutches of Pharaoh, they faced wilderness. Did the joy of deliverance and the knowledge of their God give them the inner strength to face the trials that lay ahead? Does ours? There are five principles that we can glean from the experiences of the children of Israel that can help us face life's problem without it producing bitterness. Number one, great victories are sometimes followed by great problems. Now let us understand this and accept it, that great victories are sometimes followed by great problems. Exodus chapter 5 verse 22. So, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Sur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. They were on their way to the promised land. But this was proving to be a difficult journey. And they never expected it. We see Israel move quickly from the joy of victory to the bitterness of disappointment. The text says that in Exodus chapter 15 verses 22 to 24, Moses led Israel from the Red Sea on to the wilderness of Sur. They traveled for three days through the wilderness without finding any water. They got to Mara, but they, were, they couldn't drink the water at Mara. It was bitter. That's why they called the place Mara, which means bitter. And the people complained to Moses, So what are we supposed to drink? Only three days into their journey, they encountered their first difficulty, a shortage of water. 
Can you imagine the relief when in the distance they spo spotted an oasis and their hopes rose high as they hurried to this potential life-giving water? Have you ever thought about how much water several million people would need every day? That too in a hot desert? Didn't the children of Israel and, Mos and Moses foresee a possibility of water shortage? What provisions did they make on their part to overcome such an eventuality? They may have carried some water, but they knew that they would have to rely on God to provide water and food. So why did they not wait on God? God plans in advance. They should have realized that from the Red Sea experience, but they didn't. They just complained, grumbled and griped. They continued to behave like babies. And you know how babies behave. When they are hungry, when they are thirsty, they will just scream. They don't know anything else. That's the only thing they know. The only language they understand. The only way they can convey to their parents what they need. What made matters worse was that the waters of Mara was bitter. They had hoped that they had reached the water, but at last their thirst would not be quenched. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 says, Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Easy come, easy go, but steady diligence pays off. Unrelenting disappointment leaves our, you heart sick, but a sudden good break can turn life around. God was teaching the Israelites patience. Patience was what the Israelites needed in the wilderness. We too need to patiently wait on God to deliver us from trials and challenges. God delivers, but is in own, but in His own time. Our relationship with God can begin as a father-child relationship. This is fine, provided it grows to eventually be a father-adult relationship. That is what God wants from all of us. How does God go about establishing such a relationship with us? Let's go on to point two and we'll see how God progressively takes the nation of Israel and he progressively takes us from one point as babes to the next point as being adults, sons and daughters in his kingdom. Problem number two, problems as well as victories are part of God's plans. Problems as well as victories are part of God's plans. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 23 we read, Now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the water at Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of this was called Mara. They plunged their faces into the water to quench their thirst, only to find that the water was bitter. It was not poisonous, but it was unpleasant. Because the water was too bitter to, bitter to drink, the people called the, waters, called the waters of bitterness. When it became apparent that their hopes for relief from the thirst were in vain, they reacted as they had in the past. In the space of three short days, they had gone from singing and praising God to turning on their leaders, murmuring and complaining. In truth, sometimes we can do that in a shorter time. Some of us lose our praise and forget God in the time that it takes us to get home from church. The fact that Mara came to the children of Israel is proof that it can and will happen to us. Life is made up of such experiences of highs and lows, of mountains and valleys. Some say, but I thought being saved meant that life would be without pain and that I would be, have been the presence of Jesus Christ all the time. Well, welcome to reality. Difficulties and setbacks come with amazing regularity in life, sometimes right on the heels of extraordinary blessings. We are caught off guard and gladness quickly changes to gloom and despair. It seems that sometimes when we as people of God experience blessings instead of being thankful, we can we come to expect the, that same level of blessing. If God has blessed us in some tangible way and we have enjoyed the abundance, if we do not watch ourselves, we can begin to expect those blessings as our right. We can also 
become over dependent on God like a baby can become on his parents. God was in the process of correcting such a situation. He was getting them to reach a certain balance that they required. They had to grow to a certain extent so that when they reach the promised land, they'll be able to conduct themselves as mature uh, Israelites and run their kingdom in a very mature way or the nation in a very mature way. Number three, when we murmur, we fail the test. When we murmur, we fail the test. Exodus chapter 15 verse 24 says, And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Their agonizing cry tells us of their disillusionment and disappointment. Instead of turning, on in, or turning to God in supplication and trust, they assumed that their problem was unsolvable and that they were doomed to die in this hot and arid wilderness. Even though they had only three days before witnessed amazing supernatural deliverance, they assumed that God had now left them to die. Difficulties come to us all and we are faced and then and we are faced then with how we will res respond to them. This is a story told of a little boy who was punished got into trouble with his mother as, uh, and, and, uh, and his mother decided to punish him by putting him in the closet to think about what he had done. Instead of being repentant, the boy spit on everything. His mother's clothes, his daddy's suits, the shoes, the wall, even the light socket. After a while, his mother opened the door and asked, What are you doing? He replied, I am waiting for more spit. The truth is that bitter believers are just as silly. When faced with a Mara experience, we have two alternatives. We can either get bitter and turn from God, or we can believe the promises of the Bible and be blessed by God. Once again, the children of Israel had to be taught that no problem is so severe and no danger is so great that the Almighty God cannot find a solution. Number four, God brings us into trials in order to teach us great lessons. God brings us into trials in order to teach us great lessons. Exodus chapter 15 verse 25. So he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the water, the water was made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them and, they, and there he tested them. Thankfully, Moses did not react like the children of Israel. He approached God in prayer, asking for help. God showed Moses a nearby desert tree and told him to cut off a branch and throw it into nearby water. Here, we asked, here he asked Moses to, by faith, do something that may or may not have made sense to him at that time and on a natural level. God rebuked the lack of faith among the people of Israel and told them that they uh, told them that it had been a test for them and in reality they had failed the test. But it was not God who was on trial, we have to realize that and very often when we face difficulties, we put God on trial and say, is there a God? Is he there? He's listening to us or is he like gone somewhere and he doesn't care for us anymore? We put God on trial but it is... God was really testing the people, a test that they failed miserably. We could also be failing miserably in tests that God gives us. God used these difficult circumstances to show the children of Israel what was in their hearts. He said to them in Exodus 15 verse 26, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in His sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. That is Yahweh your faith. Here we find God reveals himself as, as, uh, as Yahweh your faith. The God who heals. The word heals means also means to bend. I like you mend a garment to repair a building 
which is being reconstructed to cure a diseased person and restore him to health. Health. When we find our lives have become bitter because of our circumstances, the lesson we learn is to go to God and He will help us. He does not always do it in the way we want Him to do it or in the same way every time, but He will help us. There are several ways He may help us. Number one, He may change our circumstances and remove the cause of bitterness, a very direct way of doing it for us and that's what we usually anticipate. Number two, he may add a new ingredient as he did at Mara. Perhaps our position at work is intolerable and God does not give us a new job. Instead, he brings a new management or a new co-worker who is a Christian to encourage us. And number three, he may be, it may be that God just gives us newfound tolerance for the situation we are in. God is God and he is not restricted in how he heals our situations. He has his own way of doing things and we should trust the way he does it. The tree in the desert is an encouraging symbol even for us as Christians today. God showed Moses a tree which if he cast in the waters and he did would take away the bitterness. The Lord has revealed to us another tree, the cross of Calvary. Have we ever applied the cross of Christ to the bitter waters of our lives? There is but one physician who can heal the ills of our soul. There is a great physician and his name is Yahweh Rophe, the Lord Jesus Christ. We All we must do is run to him. He is waiting for us with open arms. It is God who can take the bitterness of the death of a loved one, the bitterness of a family relationship problem, the bitterness of severe illness, the bitterness of losing our income, the bitterness of having to yield to temptation and make those experiences to become sweet. As the psalmist discovered in his own life, that is David, and recorded it in Psalms 30 verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. God assured the people that he would continue to be with them and they made their journey to the promised land. He, assured, he assures us today that he will always be with us and in us as we journey to the promised land, the kingdom of heaven. Number five, when God is finished with the test, he takes us back to a place of blessedness. When God is finished with the test, he takes us back to the place of blessedness. Exodus chapter 15 verse 27 When they came to Elim, they were, there there were twelve wells of water and seventy palm trees. So they camped there by the waters. The children of Israel arrived at Elim, which means large trees, where they found an oasis with twelve wells and seventy palm trees, where they drank and they rested and, and were filled. So let us summarize what we have learned from the experiences of the children of Israel and Mara. Number one, not all of life is going to be sweet. Life is a combination of bitterness and sweetness. Number two, rather than complain, we must go to God with our needs and seek his provision. And number three, God not only gave them relief at Mara, but rest at Elim. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, we are told, no test of temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. You can see such encouraging words in the New Testament. James chapter 1 verses 2 to 5 says, James 1 verses 2 to 5, Consider it sheer grief gift friends when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you can become mature and well developed. Not deficient in any way. If you don't know what you are doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get your, his help and won't be condensed it to when you ask for it. 
and first peter chapter 1 verse 7 and chapter 4 verses 12 to 13 i read it together pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure genuine faith put through the suffering comes out proved genuine you can see he makes a comparison between gold and our faith when jesus wraps it all up it's your faith not your not your gold that god will have on display and it's evidence of his victory friends when life gets really difficult don't jump to the conclusion that god isn't on the job instead be glad that you are in the very thick of what christ experienced this is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. God takes us from trial to relief and back to trials and relief and in the process he trains us to mature from babes to children to teenagers to adults spiritually as we journey to the promised land and the kingdom of God. Once we stop being bitter and see the big picture we will make great progress. One day two monks were walking to the countryside. They were on their way to another village to help in the, with the crops there. As they walked, they spied an old woman sitting at the edge of the river. She was upset because there was no bridge and she could not get across on her own. The first, first mom kindly offered, We will carry you across if you would like. Thank you, she said gratefully, accepting their help. So the two men joined hands, lifted her between them and carried her across the river. When they got to the other side, they set her down and she went on her way. After they had walked another mile or so, the second monk began to complain. Look at my clothes, he said. They are filthy from carrying the woman across the river. And my back still hurts from lifting her. I still feel it getting, I, st I can feel it getting stiff. The first monk just smiled and nodded his head. A few more miles up the road, the second monk griped again. My back is hurting me so badly that it is all because we had to carry this silly woman across the river. I cannot go any further because of the pain. The first monk looked down at his partner, now lying on the ground moaning. Have you wondered why I have not? I am not complaining? He asked. My, your back hurts because you are still carrying the woman, but I set her down five miles ago. That is what many of us are like in dealing with our families. We are the second mom who cannot let go. We hold the pain of the past over our loved ones' heads like a club, or we remind them every once in a while what when we want to get the upper hand of the burden we still carry because of something they did years ago. The children of Israel could not let go of Egypt and constantly compared the com comforts of Egypt with the trials of the wilderness and held bitterness against God and Moses. From time to time they lost sight of the big picture that God was make, uh, taking them uh, as a big picture that was God taking them to the promised land that flowed with milk and honey. They lost sight of the fact that God was taking them from a father-child relationship to a father-adult-son-daughter relationship. The children of Israel did not make it in spite of all the training they received from God in the wilderness. They received some training and even after 40 years when they entered the promised land, they are not fully matured to the point where they should have been, where they should have been matured. And that's why we began to see, begin to see after that all kinds of mistakes that they make that eventually led to them being scattered all over the world. The question is, will we learn from the training God is giving us or will we like children, like the children of Israel, remain children constantly complaining? First Corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 tells us, but for, but for right now, friends, I am completely frustrated by your unspiritual dealing with each other and with God. You are acting like infants in relation to Christ, capable of nothing much more than nursing at the breast. Well then, I'll nurse you since you don't seem capable of anything more. As long as you grab for what makes you feel good or makes you look important, are you really, are you really much different 
for than a babe at the breast, content only when everything is going your way? Here's Paul making a comparison between the Christians of that time and babies. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 12 to 14. Hebrews 5 verses 12 to 14. By this time you ought to be teachers yourself. Yet here I find you find you need someone to sit down with you and go over the basics on God again, starting from square one, baby's milk, when you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners, inexperienced in God's way. Solid food is for mature, for the mature of who have some practice in telling right from wrong. First Peter chapter 2 verse 2. Now like infants at the breast, drink deep of God's pure kindness. Then you'll grow to mature and whole in God. So all these struggles that we face in life should help us grow. And one of the things we should never forget is to stay close to God and drink in of His pure kindness. What does God need from us is growth. He expects us to graduate from students to teachers to kings and priests in His kingdom before He takes us there. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and He is going to make sure that we graduate before we are in His kingdom because this is an eternal kingdom that He is taking us to. A much more beautiful kingdom than the promised land the Israelites went to. It won't be physical, it will be spiritual in nature. And Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 says, then you made them, that is the people who qualify and enter the kingdom of heaven, then you made them a kingdom, priest of our God, priest kings to rule over the earth. Are we ready for this journey? Are we willing to mature from babes desiring milk to adults desiring strong uh, wheat meat? Are we ready to mature from being fed? To feeding others, important point is not that we are going to be. We have to be fed all the time. We have to also learn to feed others. Only God can be the judge of that, and we have to think about what we are doing because we are on a journey. That's an important journey. Let us make the most of it, and let us grow the way God wants us to grow. Let us stay close to Him so that He can work with us and we grow. Let's pray to God and ask Him to give us the strength to be able to do so, and not to make the mistakes that the children of Israel made on their way to the promised land. Let us do better and we've got the spirit of God in us and we can do better and we should do better and mature to adults. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, our wonderful creator, the one who has not only created us but made us your sons and daughters, how much more can we ever think about receiving from you? Yet we have been rebellious, we not often disobeyed you, we have done all the things that we should not be doing, complaining, griping, being bitter, not forgiving others when you have forgiven us. We have done so many things, Father, and as, uh, as physical human beings, we have done even worse. Father, help us to change, help us to mature, help us no longer to be babies, but to be mature adults. And help us now, once we are adults, to help others who will need our help. Others who do not have what we have. And help them, call them, uh, uh, when you call them, help us to feed them and to help them to grow to maturity. Just like we are growing to maturity. We thank you, Father, for all that you are doing with us. And thank you for this opportunity we had to worship you and praise your name and to listen to your word. Help us to grow as a result of what we are learning by putting what we are learning into action in our lives so that we are creating new habits and getting rid of the old ones. We thank you once again for everything and we ask all this in Jesus' holy and most blessed name. Amen.